super excited to be showing this to you and, and honored on behalf of the engineering team to do so. Um, yeah, so I'm going to you know, kind of walk you through a little bit of a contrived example, um, but uh, hopefully that uh, you can see highlights um, many of the things that Shastia was, was pointing out there. Um, yeah, so if you're like me, uh, you have um, a bucket in S3. Uh, we'll take a look at mine. Uh, and in my bucket, I have some sensitive data, like you might do. Go ahead and take a look at that data real quick. Now it's uh, it's obviously a CSV file. Sorry, I think I needed to push enter there. Um, we look at it. It's uh, just a little bit over two megabytes. It's a CSV. Uh, it has uh, just about thirty one thousand four hundred and fifteen lines in it. And if we take a look at the content of it, uh, it's a pretty straightforward demo quality CSV. Uh, last name, first name, a uh, bunch of other stuff. And then, oh, my, look at that. We've got salary in there. That's, that's great. Oh, and uh, password as well um, in plain text. Um, what were we thinking? Um, well, uh, yeah, that's not great. Um, but what we're going to show you today real quick is, is how you can use S3 Object Lambda um, to redact that dynamically. Um, let's see how we do that. Uh, we are, of course, better shepherds of our security and our data than our predecessors were. And so we have begun um, adopting these, these uh, existing access points, the standard access points, for controlling permissions to our data in S3. And we've got one here, this existing uh, access point. What we're going to do now is um, go ahead and wrap that. Have I gone mute? Nope, you're still here. I can hear you. All right, sorry. <laughs> my uh, my microphone decided to stop uh, letting me know it was on. Anyway, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap that um, access point or decorate that access point in an object lambda access point. Pretty straightforward uh, configuration call. Um, you've seen it before for other things. Uh, we're calling create access point for object lambda. We're going to give it a name, the account ID it belongs to. There's this file um, that describes the configuration for it. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. Uh, first thing to point out, like Shasia mentioned, we have the supporting access point uh, that we're going to direct um, the interactions with the data with towards. Um, more interestingly, we have uh, the ARN of the Lambda function that we're using to do the transformation. Uh, and as we said, this is a standard Lambda function. Uh, it's, of course, written for purpose, but um, it can make use of any of the existing Lambda uh, platforms, any of your existing tooling or, or um, you know, operations and that kind of thing. Uh, the other aspect I want to point out here is this function payload. It's uh, very simply just a string. I'm not using it here today, but it's a string that you can use to pass kind of static configuration to the Lambda uh, in a way to parameterize the Lambda's behavior based on, on what's calling it or where it's being called from. And you can imagine using that to um, you know, make, make use of a single Lambda function across multiple access points. So that's that. I guess the next kind of obvious question that comes to mind is, how do I interact with that? Uh, and the truth is, you interact with it just like you do with the rest of S3. So here I am calling get object using the AWS CLI. I have passed in, um, instead of the bucket, the ARN of the access point that we just created. And again, I'm asking for that sensitive data and storing it as downloaded CSV so that we can kind of compare and contrast them. Um, now, the first thing you'll notice is that the, the response that I got back from S3 is markedly different. Uh, in particular, there's this additional piece of metadata called redaction type. Now, that was not there on the source object, and it definitely wasn't added by S3. And in fact, that is coming from my Lambda. Uh, you could imagine this um, being a way to communicate with the calling application about what the Lambda, you know, what kind of transformation or what additional uh, work the Lambda did on behalf of the caller. Um, in this case, uh, it appears to have done a reduction of none. Uh, and if we look at the data, that's indeed true. It's the very same size. Uh, it has the very same number of records. Um, and if we diff the two, uh, if I can type, we see that it is, in fact, uh, no different than the original object. Um, which, again, you may, not, you may not think very interesting, but um, this did indeed go through the Lambda. And the kind of cool part here is the Lambda made a decision based on who's calling. I'm the admin user right now. And according to our business rules, the admin user has direct access to the data. Um, but let's take a look at another kind of more interesting example. So, um, you know, 
we don't have data in S3 for data's sake, right? We have use cases built around the use of that data, and we have systems that implement those use cases. And over time, those systems uh, may become legacy or, or become difficult to modify. Um, so let's take a look at, at one of those uh, use cases. I'm going to assume the role of a legacy system. And then I'm going to make that very same request. So just tab up here a little bit. Um, literally nothing different. Same endpoint, different user. And I get a different response. In this case, the reduction type is mask in place. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that means. Oh, no. So you can see that the, the data is the very same size. Uh, and if we take a look at the number of records, that hasn't changed either. Uh, but if we take a look at the data itself, um, thankfully, those uh, salary columns and the password column are now redacted. And when we said mask in place, uh, what we did is effectively a byte for byte transformation, right? Every byte of the input was met with a byte of output. And that is necessary in a lot of cases because those legacy systems may be counting on certain elements of the data, right? Maybe structure or size or some other aspect that um, you know they're not able to adapt to. So in this way, we're able to maintain that for those systems. Um, but we don't have to. Uh, so maybe our, our system has, or sorry, our business has another um, requirement, and that is that uh, you know people only get to see the records of uh, people in the same department as them. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and assume the role of Alice. Alice is the director of finance, and she has access to the data, uh, but she should only be able to see again. Um, records for folks that are in her department. And so let's go ahead and do that again. Very same request. Here we can see, again, a different type of redaction. The really interesting part here is that the resulting object is a completely different size. right? Um, now, we've done a redaction here. We've made the object smaller. That's not necessarily, that's not a requirement. right? Um, we could have added more data to this. We could have removed data, or you know, removed different data, I suppose. So just taking a look at it. Um, just so you you know you believe me, uh, there's only 3,515 records in here. Um, if we take a look at uh, what the data is, in fact, we've gone ahead and just removed that uh, salary and password column because we don't even really think Alice needs to know that they exist in the data. And you can see that everybody here is from from finance, not real people, of course. I've made them up. Um, so you can see that you have a great deal of of control over the the content of the response, right? Um, but we can actually go a little bit further. Um, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you that rather by assuming the role of uh, someone who should get um, denied access to this. Now, of course, uh, we can deny access to them using IAM policies, and we, we definitely should. Um, but using S3 Object Lambda, we can deny access based on aspects of the, the request itself. In this case, perhaps um, when the request is made to S3, it needs to contain a token or a cookie or some other piece of request information. And in this case, we didn't include it. And so when we make that request, we have a custom response. Now, again, uh, I can guarantee that S3 has never responded with this particular um, error code. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to jump over to the code. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to take a, a little bit deeper look um, at the, the input that we're providing to the function. I know Shasi went over this, but perhaps it's useful to see um, in detail. So again, this is that get object context. This is where um, we're going to provide you with this input S3 URL. And this URL is pre-signed in the identity of the caller, so as Alice or as that legacy system. And this is super powerful because it allows you to write your functions in a way that they don't need additional S3 permissions. And you can preserve the permissions of the caller as you make the request to S3. Um, you'll see in some of our policy documentations ways that you can enforce that request be made through the object lambda as well. We'll see the output token and uh, output route a little bit later. Uh, their content is actually not particularly interesting to you. Um, in the configuration here, uh, we give you where the call was made from, so this access point ARN, uh, the supporting access point ARN, in case you want to know what the preferred method of interacting with S3 is. I mentioned that payload element. This is where you would find that. Uh, the user request doesn't have, sorry, the user request does have, uh, like we said, uh, some information about the original request. The URL, uh, including any query parameters uh, and any headers, um, 
these are, are pretty standard headers, but this could be quite literally anything that was, was in the HTTP request. And finally, uh, we give you quite a bit of information about the user identity that made the call. All right, uh, a real quick look at the code. You've already seen some in Python. Here's some in Java, um, but it's not all that very different. Uh, so up at the front, we're just going to get some permissions based on the request itself, uh, maybe the user that was making it, maybe some state in our system that you know isn't uh, part of the request or part of the data itself. We're going to prepare to perform a transformation. Uh, and then we're going to make that request using that pre-signed URL uh, directly to S3 and kind of connect the output of that request into our processing uh, chain here. Then we're going to make um, the right get object response. And we're going to pass those two tokens uh, to the right get object response call. This allows uh, S3 object Lambda to connect your response with the original caller. So it's, it's, it's important you give us those. Uh, you are, again, like I said, uh, also able to modify aspects of the response. And so here is where we can see that redaction type header being added. Uh, and then we're going to connect the body of the outgoing request with the body of the incoming response from S3, pipe it through our transformation here, uh, and out to the caller. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been um, a lot of fun to be able to share this with you, and I'm super excited to see uh, what you build with it. Carl, that was an awesome demo, and a lot of folks in Twitch chat were, it was becoming very clear to them how they're going to start using this as you were walking through the examples. Obviously, you started very contrived where you had a Lambda function that didn't really do any transformations, but the gears were turning. Folks were thinking, hmm, I could also have my Lambda function perform some sort of logging or, or call out to another API as it performs that transformation, and it really starts to just tie together this sort of data transformation on the fly concept uh, that that seems to be the primary uh, use case. Well, not just the use case, but you know, like what what motivates the, this feature here? Um, I think the, the really key thing about that is it's been happening behind the S3 API, right? Like mm -hmm. your applications are calling S3 and getting, you know, your codes uh, transformed data. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, you know, tying exactly what you just said together with what folks were thinking about, you sort of get the best of both worlds in that, like, even though S3, that your code is executing under the S3, your Lambda code is executing under the S3 API call, you can still, it doesn't have to be completely abstracted from you in terms of a logging and an observability perspective, because you can still, again, it's a Lambda function. You can author whatever code that you want with that. You That's can right. still get all of the good, goodies and ties in with CloudWatch. But if you really want to build another layer of custom observability in there, you totally can. Yep. Awesome. Well, um, I had a few questions that came to mind to me. I've been following along with Twitch chat. Um, so I figured we could get some of those asked. Um, first up here, um, I'm sort of wondering, and, and I know for a lot of folks that are probably used to using Lambda, they may know the answer here, but if it's worth asking, um, does the S so, so if I'm playing an object from S3, let's say it's, it's a large file, maybe a video or an image, um, what consideration do I need here for the size of my Lambda function? The main thing I'm thinking about here is, you know, what is the size of my, the relationship between the size of my Lambda functions memory to the size of the objects that I'm processing. Um, so I think one of the, the things that the demo didn't get to kind of describe really um, well is the streaming nature of that response, right? Um, we're really excited about um, offering the ability to your Lambda to pull the data in as it needs it, process it, and then as soon as that data is ready, be able to ship it directly to the caller. And so you don't need to bring everything into memory uh, to process it, unless, of course, your, your transformation requires it. Um, in terms of, of how to size the Lambda function, um, of course, the, the amount of memory you allocate to the Lambda um, does have implications for its performance in other dimensions. So I think um, for that, I would just recommend that folks do some testing with various sizes uh, and see you know, where the performance lands um, for them. That So I, I actually want to just name a use case that came to mind there and, and just so that I understand this correctly. So let's say I have a massive CSV, like it's a, it's a dump or a backup from a database. I want to perform that redaction, which I think is, is probably a really common use case here. Um, I can essentially have this, this multi-gigabyte file and Lambda will stream, let's say, row by row if it's something that's relational or tabular, such that I don't need to author a bunch of Lambda functions that, and, and break together a MapReduce function like Lambda through streaming of that data can perform that on a single 
let's say, a GET request? That, that's absolutely right. Of course, some transformations aren't going to be applicable there, but for ones that that you know you can take a chunk of the data in, apply a transformation kind of independently to that piece, and then ship that piece out. It's a perfect fit. Um, yeah, the the wheels the are turning for me. Yep. Yeah, the wheels are turning for me too. Uh, videos also come to mind here so if you're trying That's to perform exactly transformations right. on on portions of it. Wow, this is this is super awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, we, whenever we talk about S3 buckets, the idea of of uh, principle of least permissions with respect to access to that bucket comes up. Um, and I know there are particular scenarios where you do want buckets to be public again, you know, only particular scenarios. Um, but what does using object Lambda look like with public buckets? Is it allowed? Is it not allowed? Are there any best practices? Um, so we, we don't have, yeah, <laughs> we don't restrict uh, the use of, of object lambdas in any way to public or non-public buckets. Um, but we do feel very strongly that uh, the posture should be um, non-public on access points, and so uh, object lambda, by default and and um, like by definition, blocks public access to it. So we we certainly allow you to have your bucket in that configuration, but the object lambda should be um, or will be blocked public access by default. Um, yeah. We also support a full range of of policies. Uh, you know, you can apply a resource policy to the object lambda to grant cross uh, account access. Um, you know, I think that's a, another area to explore. Yeah, definitely. And and so, you know, to tie that together, you could have a public bucket for whatever the reasons may be. Maybe you have multiple unauthenticated users that can put objects to it, but none of those object, the, none of those unauthenticated users can independently invoke the Lambda function because that's gated specifically to the bucket itself. It, it gated to the object Lambda that is, is providing access to uh, yeah. The, uh, the bucket, yes. Awesome. But, Great, and then um, I feel like this may be an intuitive answer, but I think it's worth asking anyway. Um, there's a lot of value here in making this easier to use Lambda. What does the pricing model look like? Is this what people come to know and love with Lambda? Or is there any difference there? So you're absolutely right, Nick. It is super intuitive. So if you think about it, you are essentially making a request to object Lambda and getting an object back. Now, under the hood, we are having to retrieve it from S3. Lambda is processing it. So there are really just three components to the pricing here. The first is the request cost for making the request. The second is Lambda charges that apply as normal as they would today. And the third is a fee for the data that comes back to the object. And the fee is applied for the resulting object, not the object that sits in S3. So, so I have another tie-in, because it's one of my favorite things to talk about whenever I'm talking to folks that might be newer to Lambda. Lambda has one of my favorite free tiers, which is a million invocations a month. Does that extend here into S3 object Lambda? It should. If it hasn't been used up already, then yes, it'll apply. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I know throughout the day, a lot of folks ask about, you know, how do I consider whether Lambda is right for me or, or whether I should migrate my workloads will be more expensive than a stateful or serverful sort of alternative. And that's a whole nother topic for another time. But uh, if you're at all trying to do inline or on the fly processing of data in S3, that 1 million invocation per month free tier is uh, certainly a nice incentive for folks to get started without having to worry about uh, incurring costs or having uh, cost comparisons to worry about. Awesome. Well, this has been a real pleasure. I love that we got to open the day with uh, S3 Object Lambda as a, as a surprise announcement. We got to finish things off here with uh, both you, Carl, and Shasya talking about it, showing it to us in action. Um, there's been so much buzz on social media and in Twitch chat about it. So thank you so much. 